Good morning. Good morning. Let's make this meeting. I, I hope I'm doing this correctly, Stephen. Anthropomorphize. This meeting is not a practice. Before we proceed with the meeting, please silence your cell phones or beepers or something. I would like to ask everyone to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Our club mission is to provide a supportive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. With that said, please help me welcome our Toastmaster this morning, Mike Hugh. I could have utilized Veterans Day with somebody rocking with that. <laughs> so I did the next best thing. He's not even here right now. Appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Fail on that point. Second point. I chose the benefit of pets because they also save lives as well. One thing I want to speak to you is the benefits of pet ownership. Many owners in the United States reap the benefits every day of owning the pet. If you currently are a pet owner, I can just inform you on what your furry little friend is doing for you. If you are not, well, allow me to debunk a few myths and maybe change your mind on a few things. Let's see. Hmm. Let's go ahead and get started with my furry friends at the technical table. <laughs> well, let me introduce them all. Counter. <laughs> I'm your all counter for today. And as all counter, it's my function to listen for the use of filler words such as ah, uh, you know, so, okay, and other audible pauses as fillers. I will be noting if members perform any double clutches, which means to say things twice, such as this means, this means. Finally, I will also include things which might be distracting, such as lip smacks. <laughs> that will present my report and final evaluation during the ending of this meeting. Thank you. Next up is our guard dog, the Grammarian. <laughs> this evil man. Evil Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. As Grammarian, I have two roles. One of them is to expand your vocabulary, so you're going to get stretched this morning. Open wide. The word of the day is listed as anthropomorphize. The proper definition is sitting there on your agenda to ascribe human qualities to something that is not human. One of those examples, my wife likes to anthropomorphize our dog because every time their mouths are open, she thinks they're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Just because their lips curl up. <laughs> if you have an opportunity to speak, you've already given your icebreaker. The idea is you get some opportunity to fit that word in. Try and use it correctly, please. As in the adjective version here, or in an adverb case, if you're trying to do a verb, it'd actually be anthropomorph, but it doesn't sound quite the same. If you do not, you are supposed to pay a quarter. I'm sure our treasurer is eager and biting at the chomps here <laughs> yes. to collect a little bit more. Yeah. My other role as a grammarian is to listen to the use of the English language and take note of very interesting, good, and deplorable uses report from the general evaluator at the end of the meeting. Nice to test that. Thanks, sir. <laughs> and last but not least, our bird only three colors, red, yellow, and green. Mr. <laughs> 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 Chancellor, my function is to time the speakers 
evaluators, evaluators and tabletop participants to ensure they meet the timing requirements. I have a green card at five minutes for the speakers, yellow card at six, red card at seven for table topics. We get a green card at 30 seconds, yellow at 45, and the red card at one minute. And our evaluators have two to three minutes, so at two minutes you'll see the green card, two and a half, the yellow, and at three minutes for red. Um, my department. Thank you, Ms. That can be your best friend or your worst enemy. I think we all know this, don't we? <laughs> Some of you guys have horror stories of to the little Cujo or something to walk out of Pet Cemetery. Maybe our, <laughs> yes. Maybe our table topics master might just uh, have a little something to ask you. Maybe, maybe not. So be prepared. All right. Being a pet, having a great friend. It's difficult after a difficult day. You come home and just see that wagging tail, that loving face, come and embrace you. It releases a chemical inside you that just makes you feel good. Does anyone know what that chemical's called? Oxytocin. Oxytocin. Why, do we make, why does that make us feel so good? Why do we look at this furry animal? It's not a human. We anthropomorphize it. Very good. Very good. Nailed it. Very good. So. Chalk that one up. But if we look at it, when you think, thing doing for us? Why do we have this animal? Why, do we, why is it that so many of us have pets? In fact, for nearly 25 years, research has shown that living with pets provides certain health benefits. Pets help lower blood pressure, lessen anxiety, and boost our immunity. They can even help you get dates. Yeah. <laughs> All right. However, a growing number of studies suggest that kids growing up in a home with a furry animal, whether it be a pet or a dog, or, exp or exposed to farm animals, have a less risk of getting allergies or asthma. Another fun fact, I suppose. Hmm. So if we put the kid around dirty animals, the kid's going to get healthier. Great. That works for me. But uh, if the dog in the home, infants were less likely to show evidence of pet allergies. 19 to 33 percent were also less likely to have schema. Common skin allergy. Schema, is that correct? Common skin allergy? Excellent. Excellent. That's what it is, excuse me. And causes red patches, itches, in addition. <coughs> they have higher levels of some immune, uh, immune system chemicals. And a stronger sign of immune system activation. <coughs> so, that being said, allow me to introduce our first speaker. Collins Street, 5 p.m. is a popular 1955 painting by the Austrian artist John Brack. It shows office workers walking down the street in downtown Melbourne, Australia. In orderly, conformist fashion after their work day, the following is an adaptation of a true story. Speaking from the Company Communicator Manual number three, please allow me to welcome Heidi Nosier. <laughs> Today I screwed up. In fact, my whole life I screwed up. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, this is a true account of John Jerison, a 46 year old Australian. I want to get something off my chest. My whole life I've lived my life the opposite of how I want it. My dear John, you've made your life grim. You've become another Collins Street, 5 p.m. Seemed like only yesterday I was 20 years old. I had all these massive dreams. I went to the Philippines. I was planning to tour all of Asia, write a novel. I was going to show how different people think differently. And we all think that we're doing the right thing. I was going to bring the world together. And I was going to help the homeless. My dear John, you've made your life grim. You've become yet another. You've become another college student. Bye. I used to have dreams back then. Big dreams. I was innovative, creative, adventurous. 
I was a risk taker, a go-getter. My dear John, you've made your life forever. You've become another Collins Street, 5 p.m. I regret taking the safe path. I was 20 years old. I needed to take that graduate job. I needed stability. How was I supposed to know that it would change my entire life? My dear John, you've made your life great. You've become another couple of people at 5 p.m. I would go to work at 9 a.m., come home at 7 p.m., make myself dinner, prepare work for the next day, go to sleep by 10 p.m., wake up by 6 a.m., and repeat. Mate, I can't even remember the last time I've made love to my wife. My dear John, you've made your life grim. You've become another Collins Street. <coughs> 5 p.m. Five years ago, my father was very sick. My mom would keep calling me, telling me that he was getting sicker and sicker. And I was just getting busier and busier. I was on the verge of a massive promotion. And I was hoping in my mind that he would hold on until I could get to him. He didn't hold on. He died, and I got my promotion. I rationalized at the time that the most important thing in life was financial security. What was I thinking? My dear John, you've made your life grim. You've become another concert. 5 p.m. Last night, my wife told me that she's been cheating on me for 10 years. 10 years, mate. She said it's because I've changed. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not the adventurous guy I used to be. What on earth <clears throat> have I been doing for 10 years? My dear John, you've made your life forever. You've become another college student. 5 p.m. If my younger self had seen me now, he would have punched me in the face. A man of big dreams, I picked the safe path over and over again. It completely changed who I was. I don't even recognize myself anymore. My dear John, you've made your life forever. You've become another column street, 5 p.m. I have a tear in my eyes as I say this. Not because my wife cheated on me, not because I miss seeing my dad, but because I've realized just how much I've died inside. But we all fall down in life. I'm ready to pick myself up. I'm ready to make a change. No matter how old you are, you still have time to change. You can still pick yourself up. Follow your dream. Live your purpose. Find your passion. My dear John, you've made your life grim. But now, you're not at Collins Street, 5 p.m. Mr.
percentage job. Dogs for the aged, think about that, the elderly. Studies show that Alzheimer's patients have fewer anxious outbursts if there's an animal in the house. Also, their caregivers feel less burdened when the parent, excuse me, when there's a pet, particularly a cat, is available because it requires less maintenance than a dog. <coughs> but go ahead and let's just go ahead and think about that. Helping the elderly, the benefits of that. The last years of life, having a friend around, maybe they can hang on for a little bit longer. Research show that cancer patients survive longer because there's a pet in the house. But <clears throat> how do I transition into our next speaker? Here's how. She's going to be speaking on to be, a, to be the cure about donation. Now, please allow me to welcome. such a little sacrifice. Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster, and guests. The solution I'm talking about is becoming a bone marrow donor. The process to become a registered bone marrow donor is very simple, and the procedure that follows is relatively painless, requiring little sacrifice from you. You may have the opportunity to save someone's life. I joined the National Bone Marrow Registry Program Be the Match earlier this year after I watched the movie Seven Pounds with Bill Smith. The movie stars Will Smith's character as he found his new life purpose in donating all of his organs after he lost his wife in a car accident that he had caused. While watching the part when he donated his bone, his bone marrow to a young boy who was dying from blood cancer, I felt a true desire in my heart to do the same. Today I'll share with you why bone marrow donations are needed, how to donate, and why it's important that you donate. Bone marrow contains stem cells, which are essential for blood production. They mature and grow in your bone marrow and then are released into your bloodstream. When a cancer like leukemia completely destroys those cells, excuse me, or when the chemotherapy or radiation used to treat the diseases permanently damages them, bone marrow transplants are needed or the patients will die. <clears throat> The goal of bone marrow transplantation is to completely cure or treat cancers and other diseases, such as leukemia and other blood cancers, lymphomas, aplastic anemia, autoimmune deficiencies. It is deficiencies. It has been used for almost 50 years to treat these different diseases and cancers. Um, it's important. Okay, excuse me. These people rely on finding a matching donor to save their lives. You could be that match. It's simple to become a donor. The first step is to go onto their website. I'm going to give you this handout if you'll pass it around. It's on the sheet. You go onto the website, you register. They send you a tissue typing kit to the mail. You swab the inside of your cheeks, very simple. Put it back in the package they give you, pay for the postage, and mail it back to them. <clears throat> Once your tissue type is entered into the national database, one year, 10 years, 100 years from now, if you're determined to be a match, they will contact you. That's why it's super important that you keep your contact information updated on their website. They will contact you to see if you still would like to proceed. If you choose to proceed, further testing will be done to ensure that the donation is safer for you and the patient. There are two primary ways in which you can donate, through um, blood stems, peripheral blood stem cells or through marrow. The doctor determines which method is best for the patient. The most frequent method used is blood stem cell, uh, peripheral blood stem cell. That's an outpatient procedure that you do at a blood center. You go in, they stick a needle in your arm, they take blood out through your arm, it runs through a machine, they separate the stem cells, and then the remaining blood goes back into your body through the other arm. It takes about four to six weeks for those blood forming stem cells to reproduce themselves. The other method used about 75% of the time, I mean 25% of the time, is through marrow donation. 
That's a surgical outpatient procedure that takes place at a hospital. You're put under anesthesia so you feel no pain. The doctor uses a needle, pulls the liquid marrow from the back of your pelvic bone. And it takes also about four to six weeks to completely, um, for the marrow to completely reproduce itself. It's important that you become a, a bone marrow donor because every four minutes, someone's diagnosed with blood cancer. Six people will die every hour from blood cancer. You could be that care. Most of them depend on ordinary people like you for their lives to be saved. Many of them require bone marrow transplantation in order to live. You could be that hope. People of color, color have the most difficulty time finding an unrelated donor. 7% of people do not have a donor within their family. 30% do. It's important that we increase the um, ethnic diversity within the bone marrow registry so that more people can, say, can find a life-saving match. <clears throat> While you're waiting to be contacted, if you're ever contacted, there are many things that you can do in, while you're waiting. You can volunteer, you can donate financially, you can attend their events. All the information is provided on the website that I gave you in the handout. 15,000 people need a transplant. Only half of them will receive one. Tell everyone that you know about the registry. Do it today. Be the cure. transition over to getting a personal trainer. How many people pay for a personal trainer in the room? Just one. Right. <laughs> yeah, take more money, I can. Yeah, you can go for a run. No. <coughs> research, uh, excuse me, researchers have found that if you own a dog, you're more likely to get out and walk the dog. You actually lose weight, gain more health benefits from walking the dog. So, being it as we just discussed donations, think about adopting a pet come this holiday season. Now, our next and final speaker has occasionally served on a mission field in Africa. She will now tell us about an experience on her last journey and how she learned further not to prejudge. Well, help me welcome distinguished Toastmaster Stephanie Bonnie Byrne as she gives us, or excuse me, brings us things are not always as they appear. I was warned not to go, that my safety could not be guaranteed. There would be voodoo, witchcraft, bloodletting. But no, I had to experience everything. I was on a medical relief mission in Ghana, and I just had to go. Got a hard car, ascended high up a mountain, that heretofore had been hidden. I began thinking, have I lost my Jesus loving mind? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the driver stopped. You have to get out. Why? You've got to walk the rest of the way. Walk? Where? How far? 
the usual. Don't worry, just a little peace. But how will we get back to the city? Will you wait for us? Will you come back? Madame, do not worry. You will get back. With this solid assurance, we got out and began walking. Four of us descending, ascending this hill. Soon we were in a clearing with throngs of people and shots rang out. Boom, 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 boom. Normal people would go the opposite direction. I, like a moth to a flame, ran closer. <laughs> I had to see. And see, <clears throat> there was a throng of austere, regal tribal chiefs from all over the region were ascending the mountain, coming down toward us with ancient black togas on. I began looking and peeking. Then I saw him. This is why I had come. No, it's the Toastmaster fellow, Toastmaster, and honored guest. It was the ceremonial installment of a new tribal chief. Time honored and seldom witnessed by the outside. I had to see him. They ushered him in to a makeshift fort where he was going to receive people. We were going to pay homage. Two of my friends said, uh-uh. Of course, I and another, we went in. We climbed some very uncertain stairs, crossed an even more suspicious catwalk to get into this throne room. And there he sat on the ground in the dirt with his entourage. And we made obeisance to the new chief. Next, we were ushered downstairs into a large courtyard area that surprisingly had seats all around. I said, oh, this isn't too bad. They even were gracious. They urged me forward. I said, you can take pictures. And I said, how can this be? I'm an outsider. Is it because they know I and my little Nikon digital never make it out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Then I saw them, two hapless, long-haired, sad-eyed goats. <laughs> what do you expect? You were warned. Are they to be the sacrifice? Oh, Lord, please don't let them kill the goats. Please don't let them kill the goats. Then the anthropomorphic part of me said, you got a sacrifice better them than me. <laughs> then I heard them. Boom, 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 boom. Ceremonial drums. Now, I've been around African drums pretty much of my life. None like these. They were over five feet high. The players, the drummers, had to perch up on a ledge over the drums and they played with these wicked looking sticks. About three or four of them, boom, 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 boom. Suddenly, a lone dancer came into the court and he was doing the ceremonial dance, performing this time on a dance that is so important. It was practiced to perfection because it said that one mistake made by him and another could challenge his position for the new chief. <clears throat> Whirling, a dervish of black, and I detected a glint. The drum stopped. He raised the dagger <clears throat> and approached the goat. Oh, I can't look. He did the dance. <laughs> the drums resumed. He finished the ceremonial dance, then presented the two goats intact to the outgoing chief. I shouldn't have worried. Had I listened to my friends and their predictions and prejudgments, I would have never seen this entire festification. This is just one portion of it. 
It actually began days ago, and I saw some of that as well. And then afterwards, a gigantic party like you've never witnessed. And I got to witness that. The goats were received. Then the austere men, the smiles broke out. He had done his job. It all went well. The chiefs were pleased. Should I have been worried? Should I have been concerned? Perhaps. But I had no real sense of foreboding. I didn't think that I was really in danger. I challenge you to open your minds. Don't prejudge. Don't listen to everybody. Do listen to good common sense. If you're not in, I'm in a danger, there's no foreboding, experience a few things. You might be pleasantly surprised. The outgoing chief, a respected corporate attorney. The incoming chief, a Johnson & Johnson pharmacist. <laughs> 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 down the dumps, well, sometimes you come home and you wonder what's got me down, how long am I going to be feeling this depression. However, if you have a cat, they also not only offer unconditional love, but they also give their owners a sense of purpose, which can be crucial for those feelings of down in the dumps moves. Speaking of down the dumps, guess what's next? <laughs> <laughs> we have our table topics master, Mr. Mark Bell. <laughs> get into table topics, I'd just like to honor our Toastmaster. <laughs> it worked really well last week. <laughs> Anthropomorphize! <laughs> <laughs> we all love our pets. Uh, I remember when I was four years old, I used to have a dog, but was big, Pedro, and he used to walk me six blocks from my parents' home to my grandmother's house. And no one would attack a four-year-old boy in the streets of Buenos Aires, Argentina. All right, let's take a look. Got a few questions. Erica, yes. you have a pet, and what? So, what is your favorite story? <laughs> two turtles that we have. We have Little Mac and we have Speedy. <laughs> Speedy is about an inch and a half. In 50 years, he'll grow to be four inches. And he was rescued from a nest in our yard. We live off the river. And somehow there was a snake in the nest and Speedy made it to the front door. Ooh. Speedy's very special to us. We also have saltwater fish, but I anthropomorphize when I come home because my puffer fish shows me his teeth right before I go to bed. He sticks them out real big, and I look at my husband and I say, did you feed him? Because he's letting me know. <laughs> Thank you, Top of the staying up very late at night and see the commercials for the Humane Society. Have you ever 
decided to respond and buy a pet the following day. <laughs> <laughs> Masters, that's a wonderful question. I actually have adopted a dog from the Humane Society, and to today, now that one multiplied <laughs> three times, and now I have three rescues from the Humane Society. Hmm. At my house, we like to anthropomorphize our dogs <laughs> as our as our security. They are our security dogs, our alarm system. They work better than ADT does in my house. <laughs> we have. One pit bull, one pure, one purebred pit, another mix, which is a pit bull, American pit bull terrier, and we also have a husky mix. We are guaranteed that nobody will break into our house because we have three large security dogs waiting for them. <laughs> and so they are my comfort, and I'm very much very happy that I was able to rescue them and save a life and bring a new life into our home. Thank you. stories about dog fighting, especially related to pit bulls, and usually with professional athletes. In your view, what is the appropriate punishment for such an athlete? Thank you. For the topic cancer, I think dog fighting is absolutely barbaric and horrible. I guess the appropriate punishment for those people is maybe uh, sticking them in a pit where they can't get out and sticking those dogs on them that they've trained to fight and be so violent. And see what happens, I guess. <laughs> Lori, recently in the Orlando area, there's been some news about coyote, coyote, coyote. You can't even get it out. Coyotes. Eating cats. Eating pests. If you had the choice of three, A, Set out a meal laced with lead, <laughs> or B, buy your own gun to shoot everybody, or C, just call animal prevention. Which would you choose to get rid of the coyote problem? Here? I don't have to choose, I already have my own gun, <laughs> so I guess I would use it. Actually, I'm not, a, I'm not very fond of cats, so I think I maybe would allow it. <laughs> we have three dogs, we used to have three dogs, we have two now, but they've anthropomorphed into our additional children. And so now my husband and I have five children. But to get back to what you were saying, I really honestly would call animal control. I wouldn't use my phone for on the coyotes. Thank you. I don't know if I just believe that. Politically correct. Politically correct. Very nice. Do we have time for one more? Sure. All right. Uh, Gus. <laughs> tell, us, tell us a story of when a friend or visitor to your home uh, brought a pet and it didn't behave in the way that you would have liked. How did you respond? It's the table topics tell the Toastmasters and the guests. I came from work one day and I walked to the back room and I noticed there was a bird that was chirping in there. And I wanted to anthropomorphize <laughs> <laughs> what was going on there because my daughter had come from school and she had gone with her mom and another friend to the pet store down the street there 1792 and brought one and he was in the house but my greatest concern was cleaning up the mess so and I knew my daughter wasn't going to do that so that was an experience that I had and the bird lasted for only about Two weeks, and she had to give it away, Mr. DeRosa. Uh, I'll just finish up before bringing back our postmaster for the day. For you single folks out there, uh, just taking from my own individual experience, if your girlfriend, boyfriend does have a cocker spaniel, be very careful saying that the dog is fine for the rest of its life. 
I promised that to my wife when the Cocker Spaniel was nine years old and lived till 17 and a half. About seven and a half years more than I thought. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, the dog's fine. But uh, rest in peace, Polka. Thank you. <laughs> to know about your state presence, you know, how would you act out here, how would you command the room that you are supposed to speak in. And one of the suggestions I can make out is let the Toastmaster know to move this so you can really command the room when you come out and stand there and hold it very strong because every minute for you counts, moving this back and forth. There was a little bit of a movement going back and forth your hand there, and that can be a little bit of a distraction, especially when you have a colored you know, <laughs> <cheese cheese. laughs> and everybody will be looking at it when you want to. It's good to have that if you have it black and you know, white. You can also even put it on, you didn't need it, my notes say here, you really didn't need to look at it. You're very brilliant, you can remember your points clearly. <laughs> The way you told the story went clearly that you had prepared, you rehearsed this many times. It took me a while to get the point of the picture that was here, because it was here, right at the beginning of the speech. In the introduction, what Mike said got my attention to look at it and get to the point of Collins Street, 5 p.m. But it only came out in the, later on in the speech. Try to make those points in the speech. Why is this picture here? when you refer to it so that you can get our attention. You practice your speech very well, I can tell. You are very confident. You have a way of commanding the presence. This was one of the things you did in your icebreak, and you continue to do that, that you can be very confident in what you want to say. You say it over and over, and we really would get to the point. I'm looking forward more to other speeches that you have to give. This was a job well done. Congratulations. Thank you. On to our next evaluator, which is Alexander Balkan, who will be evaluating the cold cast load. Fellow Toastmasters, guests, and especially Nicole. <laughs> the purpose of the whole project was project number three, which is get to the point. Get to the point, the purpose was to present an organized speech achieving general and specific purpose, beginning with a body, conclusion, and ending. <coughs> As well, strive not to use notes and control to be nervous. Nicole, I want to congratulate you. What a way of anthropomorphizing <laughs> <laughs> a, a part of our body, which is the bone marrow, to be the cure. Not to be, I mean, the drug not to be the cure, not to a surgical operation be the cure. Our own part of our body to be the cure. That's a magnificent way 
to anthropomor anthropomorphize. <laughs> <laughs> Us. In my opinion, Nicole, the general purpose of the speech, in the way I see it, you completely fulfill it. I saw that you inform, you persuade us to donate bone marrow, as well you inspire <coughs> the audience. The specific purpose of the speech, as well, was very clear. She clearly asked the audience why it's important to donate bone marrow. That was perfectly clear. The organization as well, beginning, body and conclusion, was there. My recommendation, once the Toastmaster introduced you, I will say, take a little pause and then start. I thought that was a little abrupt at the beginning, as well as <coughs> One of the objectives of the uh, project is obviously to control or have minimum nervousness. Uh, I mean, unless you're a Stephanie or a Stephen, it's no way. <laughs> Everybody on the on dogs, obviously. Everybody, I'm nervous. Everybody's nervous that it happened. But I saw that you didn't use notes, and that's fantastic. That's part of the project as well. You didn't rely on any notes. My recommendation for a future speech, this is a very, in my opinion, medical and, and statistics and, and bone marrow. It, it, it's, it's an abstract concept. I will suggest to probably bring one visual aid, something so we can go ahead and, and, and rely what you're trying to tell us and as well to share at least one personal experience. <laughs> Other than that, you did a fantastic job and job well done. Looking forward for the next one. And on to our final evaluator, Diane Kowski, who is going to be evaluating Stephanie Bonnie Park. Stephanie, who I can't believe I got stuck <laughs> in this today, because she is absolutely a great storyteller. Oh, yeah. However, I did find some things to, to, to <laughs> constructively criticize. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about this speech is she was supposed to entertain for our age group, give a lot of vivid imagery, put it, make a story based on her personal experience, create a new story with a lesson and entertain us and give us some moral value. And she was totally successful in that. She's a natural storyteller. I really enjoyed the beginning, how she drew, how you drew the audience in when you said, I was warned not to go. And you talked about the voodoo and the bloodletting. That actually made us all actually pay attention, which was really great. But right after you did that, things were a little choppy. You got a little choppy, a little choppy. I think you were just sort of getting your bearings, and then eventually you got, you know, a little more comfortable. <clears throat> uh, it, I loved all the imagery that you used for describing the people, the characters, the, the surroundings, the festification, the obeisance, um, perching over the edge, whirling dervish, all that kind of stuff was really great and really gave us unique descriptions in our mind. And I thought that was really a wonderful way to introduce characters. Now, I would have liked a little more interaction between you and the characters, like the driver. I understand. I loved how you used the, you used the uh, accent of the taxi cab driver and all that. But it wasn't as personal between you and the, the chiefs as I would like to have seen. I would like you to have maybe said something to them or... <laughs> now, as far as the goats, it was great that you used the word anthropomorphize, but I would have liked to have seen actual more anthropomorphization of the goats when you were describing that how they looked, did they look terrified, did they look timid, did they have any kind of human characteristics, that type of thing. That would have made them 
that would have actually helped with your climax as you reached about these goats. We were, we would be really frightened for the goats. So you wanted to like give us some characteristics so that they would be more, we'd be more frightful about whether or not they were going to die. I could see, feel, hear the characters. It was wonderful. I applaud you. The, the, final, the final thing I would like is that when you're doing your twist, which is important in your story, that maybe you made it a little more climactic, just a little more edge of the seat kind of stuff about whether or not those ghosts were going to die instead of just sort of saying, oh, and then, and then he just gave the goats instead of, you know, maybe creeping up to this ending that, oh, and then he gave the goats, something like that. So great job, as usual. Thank you very much. I can't wait for your next speech. Martin, you had two ahs. Diane, you had one um, one you know, and one double clutch. I think you repeated the word about twice. Lori, you had one double clutch. Off the top of my head, it was I don't, I don't, when you were referring to the cats, so you don't like them. <laughs> Maybe you really don't like them. <laughs> Mike, you had two uhs and one so. And Alexandra, you had one uh. Overall, if I didn't repeat your, if I didn't say your name, it's because you were clear and uh, free today. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Five to seven minutes. Heidi was at 5:26. Nicole at 5:35. Stephanie at 7:01. And our evaluators who had two to three minutes. Gus was at 2:24. Alexander at 3:17. And Diane at 3:25. I saw the talk. <laughs> The use of the word of the day. I did hear it from Mike, Erica, Lori, Stephanie, Alexandra, Diana, Juliana. I guess I'm not sure what your was, <laughs> but the tongue calisthenics were great with it. And Martin, I described it. It was an adjective, not an interjection. <laughs> As for the use of the English language, Mike. Last but not least, very trite. <laughs> with that being said, and uh, Alexandra does this almost every week with with that said at the end of every meeting. <laughs> this is becoming a clutch in our culture recently, and it's getting more annoying to me, I guess. It's and, and by the way, don't call an Australian an Austrian. <laughs> But I love the introduction of table topic of speaking of down in the dumps. <laughs> Martin, coyote or coyote would be fine. Quite, quite, coyote, you have a little bit more. <laughs> but the dog is fine, yes. Lori, anthropomorphized into additional children. Excellent use of the word. Heidi, the metaphor and re repetition of it certainly was very effective. Nicole, I'd love if they come to me a hundred years from now. You'd be here. Yeah, you hang out. Gus telling us how he commanded the room. Alexandra, the speech has a body conclusion and ending. The conclusion and the ending are the same thing. It's an open and body and conclusion. <laughs> and if you anthropomorphize us, that assumes we weren't human in the first place. <laughs> I, I particularly love. Now you're saying medical and statistics. Statistics, the way you said it sounded like sadistics. Good way to put it. <laughs> I love the way that came out. <laughs> Diane, that actually made us all actually pay attention. And Stephanie, the 
beautiful use of the English language there, a mountain that heretofore had been hidden, <laughs> throngs of people, austere and regal, a dervish of black, and taking me all the way back to the SAT days, made obeisance. Madam <laughs> <laughs> General Valley. Thank you. <laughs> had a great meeting today. Uh, great theme, Mike. I, something we can all relate to. I like how you have facts and you can kind of pepper them into in between the speeches, which is really how we are supposed to incorporate the themes. You did that very well. I really liked it. Love the word of the day. We At least we had fun <laughs> hearing everyone try to use it. I anthropomorphize my rabbit at home, so it's a great use. Of course, she is a frowning face, though, so I always think she's angry. I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> For table topics, just one thing I want to mention is that they were great table topics. We've actually learned how badass we all are. I guess we've got big dogs that are <laughs> <laughs> We'll see people torn apart by vicious dogs. I really don't actually condone that, but I hate dog fighting. <laughs> but make sure that you ask the question first, then call on the person, just so that everyone's kind of thinking about it, sweating it. Making that thing. You might call on them. Yes. <laughs> but overall, I think you had a great meeting. And now I'd like to have our president, Mr. Erica Benfield. Yay! Good morning. <laughs> it was a very great morning watching everybody go up there and deal with the nerves like I am now. <laughs> this is will be the only time you will ever hear anthropomorphize out of my mouth. <laughs> you know, even though I do do it to my dog Hell's Bells. Um, <laughs> Way after she chewed up a pair of two hundred dollars shoes that earned her her nickname, yeah. but um, I felt it was a great night and I really enjoyed being here. Fantastic! Thank you. And are you a guest or a particular person? Gus. Gus. Fantastic. Lamar Williams. Again, I enjoyed the speeches. Uh, I thought you were fantastic. You did own the room. Um, you as well, great story. I felt I was actually in the story, and I was very well educated. So thank you all. Um, so overall, I thought it was a great meeting, and everyone was on point with their timing. So um, can't wait to get started. <laughs> Ruben Tavares. I really like the, uh, the speeches. You know, I didn't know what to expect when I came here. I came to see Haiti friend of mine and uh, really enjoy it and for now I'm not going to say the word so. <laughs> Going that far. Ah! <laughs> Speaker one, Mike Hughes. You're going to be here. All right. All right. Diane Menikowski. Speaker two. Speaker three, Gus Davies. What a lineup. Speaker two, Speaker three, Gus Davies. What a lineup. Table topics master Ernst, who's not here today, but I'm sure he will be here. General evaluator Julia, evaluator one, Martin Bell, Paul Walsh, Jorge Friggles. I'll counter Stephanie. Yeah. I need it for Marion. Any volunteers? I can do it. Fantastic, Nicole. And then timer, Jessica. I need a pen to write that down, but we'll make a note of that. Baseball mom. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Let's see here. I want to give Stephen 30 seconds to tell us how the district conference was. All right. All right. This past weekend was the semi-annual district conference, District 84 we're part of here, which included the finals for the evaluation contest and the humorous speech contest. I was excited of those because for my other club, both of our members made it to the finals in each of those. So it was fun to watch those. The evaluation contest, good evaluations. And you know you gotta be brave to get up there to give a speech that you're going to have eight people giving you evaluations on. And the humorous speech had us a great bit of entertainment of having to listen to eight of them back to back for an hour. Oh darn. Wow. So it was very entertaining and also watching the roast of the past district governor, you know, had lunch on Saturday. If you have the opportunity to get to any of those, I certainly suggest going by because there are also educational sessions going on if you want to learn some of those things. But the cost just for attending includes two dinners, lunch, both the contests. Given the amount they're asking you to pay, you're getting a lot out of it. So the next one is expected to be at Florida Hotel down in Orlando, which will be coming in May. Plan for that one, that will include the finals for the Table Topics Contest and the District International Speech Contest. The winner gets to go on, since there is another level, to the International <coughs> Convention in Las Vegas next year. Oh, yeah. Our club contests for that will be in February. Oh. If you intend to compete, everyone's available at, uh, eligible for doing the Table Topics Contest, and one that's paid dues. If you want to do the International Speech Contest, you will have had to have completed six speeches before the contest. So if there's anyone who's planning on doing that and needs to squeeze more in, let me know since I handle the schedule. It'll be lots of fun and plan for that next one. And even just to caravan over there and support, you know, our district, our club, we can always do that as well, especially since it's in Orlando. It's very doable. Yep. So, 50-50? Yep. Uh, yes, we don't have any. We'll do it next week. week. I think right. we could have passed it around a little better, but we still raised a lot of money, so I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> um, any other commentaries? No? All right. Well, everyone have a fantastic week. I'll see you next week.